when those start rolling. You have to have it on a bucket list. It's well worth doing. This is just a blast. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you how, how awesome this place is. Two weeks ago, if you asked me if that engine would have been running, I would have told you no. But here it is running out to hope. He's 19 years old, so pretty proud of him. And then after the fire, we just saw this big charred you know, block of you know, about 700 acres, moonscape, uh, that uh, you just gonna, how are we gonna recover from this? And I, I noticed one thing that's very different in this one, and that is the family involved. Hello, what can you do today? Do you have a diet cup? I've been coming out here since I was five years old, um, running this locomotive. Six zero Lima, request permission to go to the Klamath and Western. All right, uh, on lights, the Klamath and Western. We do want to give a shout out to Mike Massey and Steve Alley. No amount of video footage or photos online can do this place justice. If you really want to garner a full sense of appreciation and amazement for this place, you got to come up here and see it for yourself. And if you're able to make it up here to a triennial, then you'll never regret it. Ever since the invention of the steam locomotive, there has been a fascination with trains. For many, the love of trains started with a loop of track around a Christmas tree, which quickly grew into a collection of little trains. Some went to work for the railroad to operate bigger trains. Somewhere in the middle, there is a hybrid of the two, model trains that are big enough to ride on. It is called the live steam hobby, and it is almost as old as railroading itself. In the pine forests of southern Oregon, one can find the largest live steam railroad in the world, Train Mountain. Founded in 1987, this 2,200 acre park contains over 36 actual miles of track, including yards and sidings. Club members bring their trains in all shapes and sizes.
Visitors are welcome too. And no, you don't have to own a train to have a good time at Train Mountain. Several meets are held every year at the railroad park, but the biggest of all is the Triennial, which brings hundreds of live steam enthusiasts from all over the world. The first big meet was held in the year 2000. We first covered the event in 2012, then 2015, 2018, and We could watch it just kind of get closer and closer and closer and then kind of come up over the top of the butte until it you know got in the, the electric poles knocked out the power and then of course everything it ran for a little while battery power and then it quit when everything kind of got hot and fried so it was surreal to watch it just come up and take over and then we found out later that the winds came up and kind of shifted it from a southerly flow straight to the west and that really is what saved the majority of our park so our losses were basically uh, some track and some track panels, uh, the plastic panels that uh, melted, um, and some track actually kind of, you know, it, it warped and bent up. It was uh, interesting how that all happened with uh, Mother Nature. Um, but we were uh, afterwards able to go through and uh, salvage all of that. An interesting antidote to the whole thing is that when they were doing the uh, uh, fire retardant and helicopter support water drops, uh, one of the pilots up in the air noticed some yellow buildings down there on the, gr on the ground. Their focus was to try to save structures, so they came over and did a big water drop over these yellow buildings, and then it killed the fire there, and they moved on. We later realized that what he dropped his water on was the model buildings at Crane. So the model station, the water tower there, a couple picnic tables, <laughs> he didn't know the difference from the air, but he saved our little village of, of Crane siding up there. Uh, uh, by doing that. He took a lot of ribbing for that, but uh, uh, interesting stories sometimes that come out of this. So we were very fortunate. So no sooner did we get the track all repaired and back in service and everything than the following spring we had a uh, large you know, pop-up thunderstorm that came over and dropped a couple inches rain in uh, you know, like 20 minutes or something like that. That's my estimate. But we got a big mud flow down off the Steiger that came in and then just buried everything in mud and uh, displaced the track and kind of like, you know, the real railroad you see in some of the news footage of track bent up, displaced, and we had all of that. I mean, it was, uh, it, we had to look close to the pictures. Was this a real railroad or a model railroad? It was a model railroad. So then we had to start all over again. And we were able to get uh, all the main line and some of the sidings done, you know, replenished and uh, dug out and fixed and running again uh, afterwards. So again, kudos to a lot of our local volunteers uh, that jumped in and got all the track work done because that was a Herculean effort. I mean, we were talking in some spots a foot of mud and dirt that totaled the track we had to dig out. The 242 fire burned over 14,000 acres and destroyed 36 structures. Thankfully, the wind shift spared most of Train Mountain, with the northern section around Steiger Butte receiving most of the damage.
Every triennial has something new. New trains. New signals. New views. And a new name. Since the 2021 triennial had to be postponed for a year, it was decided to call this one eight, being the eighth such event in Train Mountain's history. Train Mountain is run and maintained almost entirely by volunteers. In addition to the massive cleanup on the north end, a lot of hard work is needed to put on an event this size. The final week prior to the triennial is designated as a work week. And there was lots to do to get ready for T8. Every morning at 8 o'clock, a meeting is held at the Hall of Flags in Central Station, so volunteers know what the day's chores are and who can use a hand. You're going to wear the yellow hat as much as you can around here, and that identifies you as somebody here in the organization who knows what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Once everyone has their marching orders, work commences and work trains are dispatched throughout the railroad park. An empty ballast train heads through Colton. Northern Pacific GP9 number 248 leads a pine needle train on the Klamath and Western. GP7 number 555 adds additional tractive effort to assist the heavy train on the mountain grain. And this? Well, you will see it in operation once it arrives at the job site. There is a hive of activity at Containerville, as attention is given to the old aluminum rail and treated cedar ties. There will be a lot of trains rolling through here in the next week, and Train Mountain wants to be sure everybody has a good experience. Grand Marshal Dennis Ward is operating the ballast train with his U.S. Navy 1225. With a couple thousand pounds of rock in tow, Dennis is ready to take his train out on the main line and he invites us to come along. After wying his train at Youngstown, Dennis carefully backs down the serpentine to where the track gang waits.
This is what most of the manual labor looks like. There are two ballast trains running today. Jim Davenport is also hauling rock with a DNRGW 4011. Like Dennis, he is using a cow-calf set to ensure he has plenty of tractive effort for the heavy cars. Another gang is working on the approach to the long tunnel. It takes skill and a good team effort, seasoned with some good old-fashioned elbow grease and sweat. It's working on the railroad, and the results are quite satisfying. One of the biggest chores on the railroad that runs through a pine forest is keeping up with the constantly accumulating pine needles and pine cones. It can be a lot of work to clean up, or it can be a lot of fun. For the bigger jobs, Train Mountain has a fleet of pine needle cars that volunteers can add to their train sets. The greatest advantage of any railroad is its ability to efficiently move a lot of stuff long distances. This advantage carries over into inch and a half scale. A mountain of pine needles has been placed by the track on the Klamath and Western to be moved to the big burn pit near South Portal. The train is tied down while each car is loaded to the brim. Once loaded with pine needles, it's a 30-minute ride to the burn pit in style with classic Northern Pacific power. After a relaxing ride through the woods, the Pine Needle Express arrives at the burn pit 
where the cars are emptied at the manual rollover. While work continues, a young, enthusiastic engineer in training takes her purple steam locomotive down the main line. With the day's work complete, the Pine Needle Express heads for the barn. The following morning, we find the Alaska Railroad number 1551 spotted at the back shop. The engine looks a bit dirty, and that's because it has been powering a cleverly designed piece of maintenance of way equipment, the Super Sucker. This crew is bringing out the big guns. Instead of forking needles into cars and dumping them into huge burn piles, this machine does as its name implies. It sucks the needles up, breaks them down into a mulch, and discharges them off the right-of-way, like this. The Super Sucker, a machine that really gets the job done. There's a time for work and a time for play. Now is the time for play, as Train Mountain's Triennial 8 officially begins. Crisp Yard is the focal point where trains are unloaded. Volunteers are busy making sure every train is unloaded safely and everyone finds their assigned track. Warren Root of Bend, Oregon is here. He has promised us a ride on his immaculate BNSF train, so stick around. Many steamers are assigned to Crisp Yard, so if you have a craving for good old fashioned external combustion, then this is the place you wanna be.
Other steam engines head for the turntable located behind Central Station. Steam locomotives are moved to and from the turntable by hostlers. This Union Pacific SD60M gets a good workout moving the iron horses around. The turntable can be controlled either by hand or with an operator, as Russ Wood demonstrates for us. Russ has a turntable waiting for Wyatt Thomas of Brentwood, California. This 19-year-old has been working hard to assemble this steam locomotive in time for the triennial, which is no small feat. It's a fresh new engine straight out of a Weasel Locomotive Workshop. We fired up today for the first time ever, and uh, we're going to see how she runs. She's never ran before on steam, so right now we're kind of waiting game, checking everything. And, Hopefully it all goes well, we'll be going around the river. In basketball, this would be the three-point shot at the buzzer. The triennial was coming up close in January, decided to try to give it a shot to finish it, and we made it. Uh, Sunday, the boiler was put on the chassis for the first time. Monday, the valve gear was finalized, completed. Uh, Tuesday, it ran on air for the first time. Wednesday, we did a, I did all the plumbing on the engine, and then Thursday, we we put the tenor together and the smoke box, and I brought it up here. And last night, we plumbed the lubricator and did the water lines, and now it's all up to her. History is being made on the 19th of June, 2022, as Wyatt's 280 consolidation turns a wheel for the first time under her own steam.
goal is, if everything goes well, that we're going to try to make it to Hope at least once this week. And that will be the, uh, the, holy, the holy moment in railroading in this hobby, is making it to Hope Circle. We're going to give it a shot. Why do you come to Train Mountain? And you meet people at your local club, but here you meet people from Australia, you meet people from England, Germany. You're not going to meet, meet and see this depth anywhere else. We are from Switzerland. I'm Dominic. This is my dad, Marcus. I'm Judith Williamson. I am from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. I'm from uh, Ashland, Oregon. I've been coming out here since I was five years old. We're Seabold from uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, we drove over 1,800 miles to get to our fourth triennial. What time is it over there? Hi, I'm Simon. I've dyed my hair. So since Simon couldn't be here, he's in he's in an animal form. So I've all the way from Melbourne. It's my second and I'll be back in three years. And we enjoy to ride the trains here. The people are from all over. The common denominator is the trains. Like these. Coming up, John Cooper talks about the new full-scale signals behind the back shop, and more importantly, how to read them. There is a new place to stop and have a cold refreshment on the north side, and Lilyville has become quite the boom town since the last triennial. But first, it's time to visit the inspection station and hop a BNSF manifest train for an incredible ride to Hope Circle. It goes without saying that Train Mountain is a big place. The railroad covers over 2,200 acres and has over 37 actual miles of track, meaning train rides can last hours, not minutes, depending on which route you select. Leaving Central Station, all trains stop at the inspection station, where volunteers check to make sure everyone has the required safety equipment and operators know the rules of the road. Since every train stops here, this is a great place to see just what is here. We have heard through the grapevine that BNSF 6821 is called for a morning departure out of the main yard. 
The train belongs to Warren Root of Bend, Oregon, and he lets us climb aboard for an incredible tour of Train Mountain. A new shelter is being erected at Hope Circle for the picnic area. It is made out of salvaged timber from the fire. On our way back, the train pounds the diamond at Whitcomb. The freedom to enjoy miles upon miles of mainline is one of Train Mountain's best features. Rather than simply going in circles on a loop of track, trains actually have several places to go to. And when you're done having fun, there is a way to get back.
The biggest hub of activity during a meet like the Triennial is Central Station. There are multiple trains trying to get to multiple destinations, a few derailments, and other obstacles to get around. To handle this, and because it's fun to do so, Train Mountain has installed a signal system that works on CTC, just like the big railroads use. There are a lot of little signals and some big signals. Signals in the day and signals at night. This system was designed by Train Mountain President John Cooper. John's passion for the intricate workings of railroad signals and their history, coupled with his ability to accurately recreate them for the world of live steam, makes the Train Mountain experience that much better. Tower, SP Train 9 2R. Go ahead, 9 2R. Flag a line up into 6 Station. Flag a line up into 6 Station for just a brief stop, over. All right, that's, uh, we're on lights here. Uh, give me a call before you depart the, the station. Give me a call before it departs, 6, train, uh, train 9 up. Iowa Interstate 601 to Central Tower. Go ahead, 601. We're at signal 60 Lima. Request permission to go to the Klamath and Western. All right, uh, on lights, the Klamath and Western. On signals, Klamath and Western, thank you. Tower, this is Shea 5 at Antis. Go ahead, Shea 5 at Antis. Looking for uh, elephant turntable. Shea 5 to the turntable, we're on lights. Waiting for the lights, thank you much. So how many trains we got here? We got one, two, three, four, four five, six, seven, eight trains. In addition to manning the tower, John hosts a signal seminar during the triennial where people can learn just what all those different colored lights mean. So really what you've got is a matrix. you got the colors associated with the position on the mast. The position on the mast is telling you your route. The color is telling you what to expect on the next signal. All right. New this year are the full-scale Penzi signals on the main track by the back shop. It was donated to us by the Folsom El Dorado Sacramento Railroad Historical Association in Folsom, California. And we just a few weeks ago put the finishing touches on it and uh, put it in service here on the railroad. There are three horizontal lights and that represents a red indication that we would understand uh, as being red. Of course, it's obviously yellow. It's not the color of lights that is important. It's the position of the lights. The name of this indication is called approach. Uh, it is equivalent to a yellow signal and uh, it means the train may proceed, but must be prepared to stop at the next signal. The signal has gone to a vertical configuration, which is the equivalent of green. Of course, if you're going straight, we've wired the signal to display the aspects that you saw on the, the signal that I discussed previously. Here's the approach medium, and the clear. Speaking of signals, John points out the classic semaphore on display at Hall of Flags. This is a semaphore signal in Train Mountain Railroad Museum's collection. As you can see, it's got a, a wooden blade attached to this cast iron face. Back in the 1900s, when semaphores were first uh, were used extensively, the optics weren't all that great. And so this light wasn't really as bright as what we'd need for modern railroading. So the engineer would look at the position of the blade by day, and only by night would they rely on the light. Hmm. Now if only we could put this into service somewhere. It is called the Live Steam Hobby because it started that way, with live steam locomotives. Diesels came later. The gas hydraulics have been really popular over the years, garnering the nickname lawn mowers. Now, electrics dominate the scene at Train Mountain, and they come in any shape and size you can think of. Some are small and simple, and therefore quite portable. Others are larger and simply full of awesome.
As you can see, the electrics are really popular with people of all ages and are a fun and easy way to get into the hobby. But for others, it is still all about the steam locomotive and the skill set required to operate on the heavy mountain grades found here. The regular steam locomotive, you got an engineer and a fireman. Well, here you're doing both jobs and you're conducting. You really got to pay attention to the water, pay attention to the fuel, the brakes, and then of course the signals and directions. It's hard. It's something you have to be, you know, you have to be on five things at once. Managing everything, you have to be timing out, okay, I need to turn my pressure down here in about a minute. I need to turn on my water in five minutes. You need to be, you know, right on five things, timing everything out perfectly. But, uh, you know, it's just something I've loved my whole life. Being a new engine, it uh, wasn't quite broke in yet, so um, it needed some a little bit of TLC up front. Mike Mattiota is up from the Bay Area and has been coming to Train Mountain for years. We first saw him in 2012 with his nice set of Sacramento Northern box cabs. This year, he brought a recently acquired steam locomotive. This is the uh, Allen Consolidation built in 2010. Uh, I acquired it about a month ago. I wanted to have a steam engine to bring up here and the one I was building wasn't going to make it, so uh, this was <clears throat> came on the market and it's been a blast to run a steam engine around here. It's uh, a little bit of a challenge. Every time we go out, we find something that either breaks or falls off or somehow needs to be repaired. So we run for a bit, come and repair it, go run some more. So we're gonna take it out and steam it up again. With this little boiler here, I've gotta be really careful to keep enough steam to make it all the way up from, say, from South Meadow back into Crisp. And it's a lot of work because you gotta be firing it hard and just really conserve your steam. Otherwise, you're gonna be pulling into a siding on the way up uh, to, to steam it back up because you don't want to block the main. Uh, likewise, on the way down, um, I've just got a short train behind it now, but we were running big trains earlier this week, and you've really got to be careful with those long grades. If you don't have adequate braking, you can get, a, get away from it in a hurry. The engine's nickname is Breadcrumb. Mike explains. 
customary to have something to co cover the stack when you're when you're you're coming in to kind of keep the heat in there. And so the gentleman that had it had this can of breadcrumbs that he was using to cover the stack. And uh, it's just kind of a you know just a weird little can. And uh, we've, we've actually used this now to nickname the locomotive the Breadcrumb Express, not only for the can, but for the fact that wherever we take it out somewhere, it leaves little bits and pieces so you know exactly where it went. Besides the steam locomotive, Mike also brought a fantastic string of cars, most of which he built himself. Powering his train is a beautiful Pacific owned by Brandon McCracken. It was built in 1965 by Ken Graham and weighs around 1,300 pounds. It has no trouble pulling Mike's train around. When traveling the north side of Train Mountain, there is a new station on the timetable named Clyde. Located between Whitcomb and Beauchamp, Clyde features a water tower, a small yard, and a place to rest and quench your thirst for a price that can't be beat, although donations are welcome. You even get service with a smile, at least we did when we were there. After stopping for a chat and to stretch our legs, it's time to head back to South Meadow. Arriving in Lilyville, we find the Applegate Southern number 406 in the hole while traffic passes on the main. This 14-year-old engineer has been coming to Train Mountain for most of his life now. Uh, my name is Zane Abin. I'm from uh, Ashland, Oregon. I've been coming out here since I was five years old, um, running this locomotive. And uh, you know, it's just a hobby, just a passion I love. I'm a rail fan, rail fan all over the Pacific Northwest. And I uh, just love to have a place to come out to like this, to come out here and enjoy my hobby. So what makes Train Mountain different from other live steam railroads? You have some really steep grades here. It's a lot bigger. It's, uh, it's a lot harder, I'd say, just because there's a lot more railroad. Um, it's a lot more complex track, so you sometimes you don't know where to go. You know, if you're new here, you have no idea where you're going. So mm -hmm. it's uh, definitely like look up a map if you've never been here before. A fast-growing town on that map is Lilyville, located on the Rio Grande Loop near Midway in South Meadow. It started just as a few structures and a corral full of plastic livestock and has become quite the western town. Lilyville is the creation of Jim Eakin of Hillsboro, Oregon, and he has put a lot into this town.
Lilyville isn't the only place where you'll find new buildings. There are others on the Rio Grande Division, like this handsome replica of the Stockbridge Railroad Station in Massachusetts. It was built and donated in 2019 by 11-year-old Mormon Boy Scouts from Antelope, California. While admiring the depot, we hear a train coming on the main line. Looks like Caden is at it again with his Canadian Pacific power and another long train of gondolas. One of the big campsites at Train Mountain is South Meadow, and boy does it fill up during a triennial. Tired of the rat race? Need a place to come and unwind? <laughs> then Train Mountain has just what you're looking for. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Enjoy fun with the whole family. Wait! My train! Wait! Blow off a little steam. And leave your troubles behind. Are they? What are they doing? They got a green signal and they're not going. Uh, they're re-railing uh, their engine over. Aha! Uh -huh. uh -huh. Am I just... Oh! Oh, it just barely cleared it. <laughs> The original live steam railroad in Chilliquin, Oregon was started by Ed St. John and today is known as the Klamath and Western. Years ago, club members started a tradition of giving rides to the public on Sundays during the summer months. That tradition still lives on, providing many people with their first taste of the live steam hobby.
Not all the trains on the K&W are giving rides today. This classic Alco sporting Spokane, Portland, and Seattle paint is powering a track maintenance train. These volunteers roam the entire 36-mile system looking for green blocks that indicate a possible defect in the track. With hundreds of trains at the event, the track sees a lot of use and volunteers log many hours each day to make sure things are running smoothly. So, when you are out and about and see a track maintenance crew, be sure to thank them for their hard work. Or better yet, sign up as a volunteer. Even just a little of your time will make a big difference on the railroad. There are lots of opportunities for volunteers at Train Mountain. Loading and unloading. Inspection station. Operating golf cart shuttles. Being an engineer or conductor on shuttle trains. And many more important tasks. When your volunteer time is done, you can go back out and play. That is, if you ever really stopped playing. Looks like Weasel is still putting his steam locomotive through its paces as he works toward his goal of running all the way to Hope Circle. He has promised to let us know when he thinks he's ready, possibly tomorrow. At Drain Mountain, anything can happen, and you never know what to expect. We caught wind that a wedding ceremony was going to be held at Blue Caboose. The bride-to-be isn't just walking down the aisle, she is arriving in style, decked out in a wedding dress that, most will agree, has quite a long train. <laughs>
One of the main attractions near Central Station is the Vendor Barn. Whether you are looking at getting into the live steam hobby, or need an upgrade, or a really cool addition to your railroad, then this is the place to be. There are engines, cars, trucks, speeders, signals, uh, and sheep. Also, great live entertainment. This is the Gandhi Dancer competition. Teams compete for the fastest time in assembling a track panel. This is where you can see new locomotives and rolling stock on display and in motion because that's how we roll at Train Mountain. While we've been enjoying the vendors, the wedding train, and other interesting sidetracks, Wyatt Thomas has been working toward one goal, getting his new 280 consolidation ready for the ultimate test. The long climb to the remote most northern point on Train Mountain, Hope Circle. He finally feels she is ready. While Wyatt takes on water and lubes his running gear, his dad, Matt Thomas, arrives on his gas-powered Shea that was featured in the 2018 Triennial. He is along to show his support, even modeling this really cool t-shirt. But he lets his son have his space. Two weeks ago, if you asked me if that engine would have been running, I would have told you no. But here it is running out to hope. He's 19 years old, so pretty proud of him. This is the Weasels Project and his show. And now, it's up to him. Nearing the top of the climb, there is one final water stop at Crane. that week of no sleep and lots of determination, but here we are. 
and we made it to Crane. It's one thing to see pictures or watch videos of Train Mountain. It's quite another to see it in person. I'm Jacob Smith. I'm from Stewart, Florida, which is just, just northwest Palm Beach. This is my very first triangle ever. My dad and I came out here. This is just a blast. I mean, I can't even get, begin to tell you how, how awesome this place is. We've been here since the first day of the triangle and been riding on, on our French equipment. Even made some new French while we're out here, like Mike here with his belt and got to go up with Hope Circle with him. That was a great trip. We got to meet with Matt Thomas, which you interviewed in your last DVD. Great bunch of guys. Got to know who's some Wyatt with his consolidation and how successful his trips have been up around the railroad. Usually it doesn't go well for Dad and I because usually we, with our equipment, there's always something that goes wrong on the first test run. <laughs> Judith Williamson is from Victoria, British Columbia and we have seen her familiar purple engine in several triennials. We asked what keeps her coming back. It's around my train, obviously, but it's to reconnect with old friends, um, because sometimes you only see them at meets. I mean, we live all over North America, so it's a common place to come and reconnect, make new friends, which I've done this triennial as well. And with COVID, this is the first time I've been in the States since March of 2020, so it was great to get out, and I actually had not run my engine for two years, so this was great. And she puts a lot of miles on her little engine. It's, it's just a ton of fun. I've I've rebuilt my engine numerous times because I've the, the flanges on a couple of the wheels broke through lack of use for too much use rather. Uh, so I've rebuilt it, new control panel, new motors. I actually burnt the motors out of the last triennial. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sam, Sam Poole, who used to own Plum Cove, he says, "You know they're only warranted for a million miles, don't you?" <laughs> and the next day, I burnt the motors out. So, uh, oh yeah. Is there a favorite place that you like to run? I really have no favorite road, but I really enjoy going up to Hope because it's long, and you can just enjoy the scenery and. Um, I was a bit nervous about going up there because people said that it was devastating. I don't find it devastating. I look at it as a, as a new beginning. There's new growth. 
and I see I see new life I see you know the wildflowers the different colors and I, I see a new beginning I'm thankful that crane wasn't damaged or obviously the cell towers but um, I think hope by far is is my because it's a nice destination I've got a lunch pack for today and, and this sort of thing and I was up there last night at sunset which was great so it's perfect yeah Sunset at Hope is definitely something not to be missed, and we'll take you there. But first, there is plenty to see even if you don't wander too far from Central Station. The main yard is where you'll find most of the gas and growing number of electrics and the opportunity to do something you just can't get away with on a big railroad. Wander around the yard and take roster shots like these. At dusk, many trains are tied down for the night, but others are fired up and head out on the main line to enjoy another aspect of Train Mountain, night running. To the north, a small group heads for Crane and on to Hope Circle to enjoy the last minutes of sunlight. The triennial lands right around the summer solstice, taking full advantage of summer nights.
With dusk settling upon the land, some start back for the yard, while others remain at home. Meanwhile, back at the yard, UP-9656 slowly approaches signal 12R, which is displaying a solid red. Although the tower is closed at night, the CTC system is up and running, and trains are still governed by signal indication. Soon we see the reason for the red. Another train was already lined out of the long tunnel. As soon as it is clear of the block, signal 12R changes to a permissive flashing red, and UP 9656 proceeds on its journey into the Earth's shadow.
While several night trains shuffle around the yard, others continue to arrive over an hour's ride to the north at Hope Circle. Tomorrow is the big climax of the triennial with the big toot and parade. So it's time to head back off the mountain and hit the rack. In keeping with a triennial tradition, as the event draws to a close, everyone assembles at the main yard for the big toot and parade. The parade will be led by Grand Marshal Dennis Ward and his wife Barbara. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. You're in the heck out of there. Dennis has been one of the hardest working engineers at this event. Every day he was running a shuttle train and giving rides at the Klamath and Western on their run days. This is the beginning of the Big Toot and the Parade of Trains. Just before the Big Toot, everyone gets off their train for a photograph. All right, perfect. Back to your trains. Triennial Committee member Jeff Mills gives the command for the Big Toot over the radio. Okay, everybody ready for the Big Toot?
The Train Mountain Triennial is an incredible event that brings people from all over the world, and it takes a lot of hard work to put it all together. We had a really, really good triennial meet this year. Uh, my particular position is uh, one of the three co-chairs for the whole event to help organize and uh, run it and oversee it uh, throughout the, uh, the week and the preparatory week before that and even months before that as we you know, planned it out and got organized. It, it takes about a year's worth of uh, uh, planning and hard work to bring it all together, to get it organized. The vendors you know, have to have notice in advance and get all that uh, organized. Uh, food vendors. So there's a lot of little individual pieces that all have to get planned well in advance and then all brought together you know, to put this on and together. Uh, the key is uh, all of our terrific volunteers and uh, I want to thank them profusely for stepping up and helping out um, from manning the uh, first aid booth to the front gate and the back gate and the registration and uh, running the golf cart to bring people around and the shuttle trains and I mean it just goes on and on and on and uh, we could not do it without volunteers and the dedicated people at Train Mountain that come all the time as well as the folks that only come you know once every two three years and then they step up and give us a couple three four hours uh, during the time they're here to make it all work it's just it's a huge project uh, as anybody knows who's been involved in any kind of a, a public event uh, it's, it's a lot of work but it, it's rewarding and it's uh, well worthwhile so I think everybody had a great time I've heard just nothing but lots of kudos from uh, the folks that did visit participated and got to run their trains all over it's just a fantastic railroad to, to learn on and have fun and uh, certainly enjoy bringing my family up here to you know, play trains and meet, meet old friends and that you haven't seen in a couple years, so really cool. It's just, it is an amazing place to, uh, to be behind a steam locomotive. It really, it challenges you all the time, but it's so great to be behind one of these things and here at work and, and just, you know, put these things to the test that they're designed to do. Each time I've come here, it's gotten better and better. Um, you know, I got the full-on experience this time, did some volunteering. You have to have it on a bucket list. It's well worth doing. Definitely worth doing. This is my second, and I'll be back in three years. This this has been in the past a uh, senior citizen's hobby, and hobbies like that have a hard time continuing. We've got to get uh, the younger people involved, and that is happening. And it just made me so happy to see all the families with the wives and the kids and all of that at this triennial, and I really hope that continues. I'd like to see it continue doing all of our meetings. No. Why are they hiding behind oh the cameras? No, so... <laughs> <laughs>